Let's read that passage once more, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel, hymn 36, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Last week from this passage from 2 Peter, we were exhorted as those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, who have been welcomed in God's grace to a life of fellowship with him, we were exhorted to truly live out the reality that we are partakers of the divine nature. What a remarkable and, and almost unbelievable thing that is, that, that this is who God has, has made us, partakers of the divine nature, that God would, would draw us so intimately close to himself and, and cause our lives to be lived with him. You have become divine royalty. You have become heirs of God himself. How amazing that is. God has lifted you up, as we read in this passage, lifted you out of the corruption of this world, out of a life of sin. He has rescued you from the depths of hell that we would have been destined for, and he called you to a life with him. And for that reason, for that reason, because all of that is true, says the Apostle Peter, therefore... Make every effort to do these things. Put on these things. And there comes this list of virtues that we didn't have the opportunity to spend much time in last week. So that's what we're doing this morning, brothers and sisters. We're being instructed in these godly virtues that are fitting for the household of God, for those who are partakers of the divine so that's our theme for this morning. Since you are partakers of the divine, strive for overall this aspect of godliness. So we have these list of virtues that ought to be present in the Christian life. These are the fruits, these are the results of being partakers of the divine nature. We're being commanded here not to, not to sit and wait to see these things, but we're being commanded and instructed to strive, be eager to cultivate these things, be eager to add one of these to another. And now, this must be said, we must remember this, this is a command. Strive for this, be eager to cultivate these things, but do not forget that these things are gifts of grace. God gives these things to us. But he also commands us to pursue and cultivate them. There's no contradiction here. God gives these things as gifts of grace while commanding us to pursue them and while helping us to really lay, to lay hold of them. So let's, let's go through these. We'll read from uh, the beginning here. For this very reason, make effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. Now, I want to mention a few of these we're, we're, we're going to take together, um, paired up uh, a number of these because they are so intertwined with one another. So example, um, 
the, the idea of faith and, and knowledge. They're so intertwined together, we'll, we'll take those together. And those are the first ones that we'll uh, meditate upon this morning. Faith along with knowledge. What is faith? Well, for those of you who have been catechism students for years and years and who have become very familiar throughout your life with uh, sermons that follow the framework of the catechism. We remember the definition of faith that is given in Lord's Day 7. What is true faith? Well, true faith is, is two things. Number one, it is a sure knowledge. It's a knowledge of the gospel, all that God has revealed to us in his word. But it's also a firm confidence. It's trust in God. So we are being commanded to cultivate an absolute trust in God in all circumstances. Now, how does this come about? How can you obtain trust in God if you do not have it yet? Well, first of all, by knowing the things that God has done and by knowing what he is like. In the whole of God's word, the, the story of, of God interacting with man, God is displaying himself, and he is displaying what he does. He shows his power, his wisdom, his trustworthiness. He shows his great love for us, and that gives us confidence in him. We read in Ephesians 3, verses 16 through 19, May God grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and, height and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We know God. We know what he is like. We know his love and commitment toward us. When we see the record of what he has done throughout all ages, we grow in faith, first of all, through the preaching of the word of God and partaking in the sacraments. These are the primary ways that God has designated for you so that you more and more may learn to know and to trust God. And of course, this doesn't exclude the godly exercises of faith that are, that are done outside of the worship services. They're done throughout the week. Prayer, personal prayer, feeding on the word of God by yourself, marveling at the, the treasures that God has revealed. Meditating on the word of God with your family or, or with your boyfriend or girlfriend growing in your knowledge and, and trust in God, growing together in all of that. We're blessed here in this congregation with a number of Bible studies. What wonderful opportunities these are to, to grow in knowledge of God, to grow in your confidence in Him. It's a number of women's Bible studies that meet together. So also a wonderful Wednesday evening Bible study the, the YPs spend time together growing in the knowledge of God, studying his word, helped with many resources, and of course, you help one another in this pursuit of the knowledge of God. Make every effort to add to your faith these things. So that's faith, and along with it, knowledge. Knowledge. Next we have virtue. Add to your faith virtue, and along with that we'll take goodness or godliness that is mentioned. What is, what is virtue or godliness? Well, this is a, like a, a, a moral excellence that the people of God must admire and must strive for. This is loving what is good 
and hating what is evil and fling from it, living according to practical wisdom that God reveals in his word. Now, we have to recognize there are, there are two parts of this that, that we should see. Number one, again, this is a gift of grace. This is a gift of grace. God gives the gift of a regeneration of heart and mind and, and our affections, our desires, so that we are attracted to what is good instead of, instead of being inclined to evil, being inclined to hate God and our neighbor. We're attracted to do what is good. We, we, we love and desire to be able to live in according to God's ways instead of you know, having a, a calloused heart. For example, let's say someone who, someone who has become a, a, a habitual shoplifter. Right? Think about the first time a person commits that crime or commits that sin of, of shoplifting. Maybe the, the first time there was fear or guilt, but, you know, after 200 times, well, then that, that guilt and, and that shame of it dissolves. It, it goes away. It doesn't bother the conscience anymore. There's no disgust over the sinfulness of it. But God grants new hearts. God grants new hearts that have that sensitivity to sin. Hearts that recoil from what is wrong in the same way that, that God recoils from what is sinful and, and wrong. This is a gift of grace. This is a heart that God gives, but at the same time, it is a gift that God calls us to cultivate and strengthen. Again, learning the ways of God, meditating on His laws. We sang from Psalm 119 about the commitment to learning and meditating on the precepts and, and laws of, of God. I, lie, I even lie awake the whole night through that I, your steadfast promises, may ponder. But you are near and I on you depend, for true are all the words that you have commanded. Long have I known that they are without end. All your decrees you have forever found. And how beautiful are the decrees and precepts, the commands, the goodness that God teaches us. And God helps us with His Spirit, through the working of His Spirit, so that we do love and desire to do the law of God. What an amazing thought that is when, we, when we've heard the, the commands of God again this morning and, and we know which ones we're especially inclined toward. We know our weak spots. And the promise that God gives is that He changes our hearts in respect of those sinful inclinations that we have to fight against all the days of our lives. He promises that we will be more and more conformed after the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You will be more and more like God in doing what is right, godliness. At virtue to faith, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with Self-control, self-control with steadfastness. We'll take self-control and steadfastness together. Self-control is the outworking of this victorious proclamation of the gospel that you are no longer slaves of sin. That is one of the most wonderful aspects of the gospel, isn't it? That according to our nature, we were inclined to sin. We were inclined to hate God and neighbor with, with absolutely no power in ourselves to do anything at all but sin. This is the illustration that we, 
receive in, in the story of the Exodus that we are also in the process of working through, the helplessness of the people of Israel to free themselves from the bondage of, of slavery. They were completely in Pharaoh's clutches, and they could do nothing to free themselves from it. But God, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, freed them from sin, or freed them from slavery, and gave them a new life with him. The gospel is that Jesus Christ was sacrificed to free us from that kind of slavery, that kind of helplessness, not only washing our sins away, not only forgiving us and sort of giving us a clean slate, but breaking us free from the dominance that sin would exercise over us. How helpless we feel sometimes when we stumble, when we fall into temptation. Jesus Christ was sacrificed to free us from that slavery so that we are able to have him as our master, have a new master, one that loves us and does not destroy us but gives us life. It is on the one hand a gift of grace. It is God's act of salvation, granting liberty so that we are able to overcome temptation we must believe this wholeheartedly. God promises this. God does grant this to each one of us. But again, on the other hand, it is a gift that God teaches us to cultivate. When you trustfully begin to, to practice this, you recognize God's hand in it. You recognize his sustaining hand, his, his power in your life, the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And what does that give birth to? When you recognize that it's not me doing it, but God is enabling me to, to have this self-control that I didn't have before. When we see God's work in our lives, that, of course, gives birth to a wonderful confidence that for the next test, right, the next time around, the next time self-control is needed, God will be there. God will strengthen you. You will become steadfast in your life of holiness. You now, finally, Brotherly affection and love. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the ultimate, the supreme outworking of a new heart and mind that we are given by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the, at the core of being an image bearer of God. And brotherly affection, love for the saints, love for your brothers and sisters in Christ is especially in view here. God calls us all to, to, live, to live out what he has made to be true. He has brought us all together. He has made us part of one household the family of God, the household of faith, and our devotion to one another, it ought to reflect that, shouldn't it? The love that we are prepared to show one another and that we are equipped to show one another, it should be surprising to anyone unfamiliar with the Christian life. It should be strange, the kind of things that we are willing to do for one another. What does, that, what does that look like? 
How has that worked out? How do we do that? You know, seven days a week. Well, we all belong to this congregation, right? What does that mean? You know, we all have our names on a membership list. Is that as far as it goes? Of course not. It means we have a, a, a profound kind of unity that causes us to be incredibly committed to one another. We are, on the one hand, united to Christ by His Spirit, and so now we are also united to one another by that same Spirit. That is a powerful thing. We are one entity, almost one living being by nature now, and it's in our nature to love one another, not just in words, but also in deeds, as we hear every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That fellowship that we enjoy and see at the table is something that should be lived all the days of our lives together. How can we do this? Well, you show your love and devotion to each other by spending time with one another. Primary is, is worship together. Worship the Lord together. Assemble together with one another and with our God himself. Do not neglect meeting together. Engage with your brothers and sisters before and after worship services. Share with each other. Learn each other's lives. And then you are able to know how to pray for one another and serve one another. It's a service that we render to one another out of love. Having genuine concern for the well-being of the people that God has united us to. I mentioned this last week. Ask your ward elder, your ward deacon, how you may be of service in your own ward or, or more broadly throughout the congregation. And elders and deacons, this is a task that has been given to you. Equip the saints for works of service. I mentioned Bible studies and, and YPs earlier. Yes, this is wonderful for your own growth in, in faith, in knowledge, but this is also a tremendous act of love that you are carrying out for each other. You are growing in faith, in, in knowledge, not only for your own sake, but for the sake of the one next to you, to help them grow as well. Live in every way together, sharing the gifts that God has given to each one of you, using them cheerfully and lovingly for each other's well-being. And what blessings abound when we love one another with that kind of love. Now, we've been instructed about what our life should look like. We can recognize what sort of life is, is fitting for the household of God, for partakers of the divine nature. Hearing all of this, what, what does that cause in your heart? What reaction do you have hearing that you are being called and instructed, commanded to put on all of these things, put all of these things into practice? What does that cause in your heart? Well, on the one hand, maybe your heart sinks a little bit. When we reflect on our weaknesses and shortcomings, we think about the sins in our lives that seem to get us every time, and... We think about all of the ways that we know we should have been serving one another and, and just didn't for whatever reason. We feel so far from the righteousness that, that shines from God. We're so far from that. We might compare ourselves to the holiest ones in our lives that we know, and, and we think, man, I am so far from that. So is this even me? Well, Peter's purpose with this list of, of virtues here is not to drive you to despair. It's rather the opposite. Right? The sin in our minds wants to deceive us, and, and 
and make us think about these virtues incorrectly. The sinful way of reacting to this is to say, oh man, like I'm in a bad way here and and I need to do all of this and, and then I will be acceptable to God. And until then, like it doesn't apply to me. I'm out of the picture that is false. Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? Do you confess your sins before God and trust that you are washed from all of this first of all? Do you believe that? Yes. Paul is writing this to, in verse 1, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the right, not our righteousness, but by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. You are never so dead in your sins that you are beyond the reach of the grace of God. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean, as that hymn goes. If you are a sinner, like everyone here is a sinner, his blood can wash you clean. Believe this. Then these things are yours. Maybe you have not seen the, the full outworking of all of these virtues. You haven't seen them spring to life in you yet. As you, as you have prayed for, as you have already strived for, but God promises that they are yours. And you must believe that. And when you go forward in faith, when you go forward eager after these things, in a heart of obedience, being eager to do all of this, trusting in God that this is his work of grace, you will receive this. They are gifts of grace that God will certainly help you to cultivate. And the wonderful gift that God gives through these things is the unshakable confidence that your names are certainly written in the book of life. That's how he ends this passage, right? Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an inheritance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These things are evidence of God's work, evidence of God's calling and election. In 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul rejoices because of what he sees in the Thessalonian church. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, so because of that, because we see this, we know, we know that you are loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in words, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. What rejoicing comes when we see this kind of God's work in the midst of God's people. It's wonderful that just as the Apostle Paul was able to give thanks and rejoice because of God's work in the Thessalonian church, we can give thanks for what we see here in this congregation. Yes, many of us struggle In this aspect or that aspect, we have not added all of these things in in great degree in our lives. But God promises that we will. And we see them here in, in this congregation. In our consistory meetings, we bring many matters before the Lord that that are matters of difficulty matters of concern, but we remember to give thanks too that the Lord is at work in such powerful ways in you. We hear the stories of the acts of love that are being carried out 
for those who need it the most, the service that is rendered in your midst, the faith, the perseverance, these gifts of God he is pouring out in Providence Church, and for that we give great thanks. This is making our calling and election sure. What confidence we are able to have that the God who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. What love for God and for the saints abounds in this wonderful knowledge. Amen.